good morning, everybody. Welcome to Redemption Online. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend some time with us and with Jesus this morning. What an exciting couple of weeks that we have come off of here at Redemption Church. We yes. have had so much fun. We've so been much. so busy. Yes. We have um, witnessed to the community. We've had a busy couple of weeks here at Redemption Church, to put it yes. uh, bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> we have had a wonderful time with the children. They yes. put on such a wonderful service yeah. last weekend. And so many of you showed up and were able to view the children um, praising Jesus. Yes. And it was a, just a blessing to yeah. see that. Um, it was great. I think we had had over 1,100 people here oh, at our church um, yeah. between all of the services. And you know, that's a great number, but I think one of the numbers that really um, spoke to my heart and made me know that the Lord is working here at Redemption Church yes. and um, that he is speaking to the hearts and the minds of those that walk through these doors and making such a difference is that we had 63, 63. people it's give 63. their hearts to Jesus yes. and ask them to come in and to be their Lord and Savior. And you know what? That's, That's what it's all about, yes, Sydney, right? Absolutely. Hey, Sydney, thanks for joining me again today. No problem. Um, I love it when you come and you sit here and you talk with us and you yes, share Jesus. I love it. So, so much. thank you so much for that. No I appreciate it so very much. So, Sydney, we're going to talk about some exciting things that we have coming up here at Redemption Church. Yes. We have some events coming up, more <laughs> events that you have an opportunity to take part in. Yeah. Um, this is some exciting things for the youth. Yes. Uh, oh camp gosh. season is upon camp us season. here. Um, so, that's exciting. Gotta love it. Um, we gotta love it, right? Um, this week I was reading um, in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, and it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I don't know what's going on in your life or, um, you know, what situation you may be going through. But, you know, we can be anxious about things in our heart and life. But the Bible says in every situation, by prayer and, and petition, give um, your request to God yes. and guard your hearts and minds. I love and, that. And uh, I love that scripture. Yes because we all go through things and we don't know what the outcome will be, but we can trust in Jesus because yes. he's got it, yes, okay? Absolutely. Right? Yes. Um, and oh I gosh. love that promise. So now we're gonna talk about some wonderful things that we've got going yes. on here at church. What is one of the nights we have coming up here? April 28th, Trivia Night. Oh my goodness, April 28th, that's gonna be here before you know it, Trivia yes. Night. Now, I don't know about you, are you good at trivia? A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. You? <laughs> I, can, I can do a little bit of trivia. I have a feeling you probably are one of those kids that probably know a little bit about a little bit about everything. You put on a Disney quiz, I beat it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot about Disney. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So trivia night, we're putting this on to help raise funds Mommy, for these yes. kids to go to camp this year. We have mm -hmm. two different groups of kids going to camp. And yeah. camp can be kind of pricey. Kind of pricey. Just, kind of pricey. Just a bit. Now tell us how, what did you think, you've been to camp the last couple of years. Yes. What do you love about opportunity to go to camp? Making the friends that you make. Okay. So for example, um, I have two friends in Texas. Uh -huh. Shout out to McKenna and Aubrey. Oh, well hello um, McKenna and Aubrey, did you say? or? So, yes, McKenna okay. and Aubrey. Uh, okay. Um, and also our Bible study group called The Alliance. Uh -huh. I miss them so much. Oh, my gosh. They were so great. Oh, that's um, awesome. And I still keep in touch with them to this day. You and do? And so it's been almost a full calendar year. Oh, wow. So, so that's awesome. So you keep in touch with them. Yes. And uh, so you guys, do you text each other? How do you keep yes. in touch? Yes. So okay. we have a text message group chat and then me and Aubrey text message each other uh -huh. and then me and McKenna have Snapchat. So we're texting, awesome. we're, yeah, um, we, we talk to each other every day. So, I mean, it's really so nice. So the friends that you make are one of the most special parts about um, camp. Yes, camp. absolutely. Okay. That's awesome. So yes. the kids here at church have an opportunity to go to camp. Trivia night is going to help us raise funds yes. for those who need help going to camp. It's so yes. important. And it makes it's, such a difference in these and it kids' helps lives. So much, mm -hmm. uh, like with people who can't afford it, because it literally changes their lives. It does. It changes their lives for yes. the better. Now it's twenty dollars per person, but with that you get a meal 
and, and you get trivia. to participate in trivia night. So Which is I nice. think it's a pretty good deal. Yes. Um, and our students are going to help serve that meal to you. So yep. that's going to be pretty awesome. And uh, it's April 28th, starting at 6 p.m. Now we have a couple questions we want to ask you at home just it's 90s trivia 90s so i'm going to give you a little help here i don't know if you guys are good at 90s trivia or not yeah um so you weren't even around in the 90s no i was not <laughs> i'm looking I'm an, over i'm you an oh eight kid i don't even know but i got no. a couple folks around here come on up guys come on. Come i've on. got my daughter hannah hey hannah barely around in the 90s she was born in 99 and i won't ask steve, steve. <laughs> Steve, were you around in the 90s? This beard says I was around oh. in the 70s. <laughs> okay. Almost in the 60s. Oh, okay. You're really giving it away, aren't yeah. you? So um, I was around in the 90s for sure, too. I was yeah. around in the 70s as well, Steve. So oh. um, we both lived through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. To, oh, my. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> we're just really giving it away, right? So we should be good at this trivia. Yeah. So... Go ahead and shoot with that trivia question. So my trivia question is, who was the very first rapper to hit Billboard number one in the 90s? Ooh. I was thinking Will Smith, but it's probably Vanilla Ice. Okay. You're right. Oh. You're right. That's oh, right. very good. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, he was right. Pressure by Vanilla Ice. No, it wasn't pressure. That's a rip off of... Uh, <laughs> Queen and David Bowie was the original. Oh, well, he's getting really deep. Okay, so what? I mean, it's, it is his most popular song, though. It is his most popular. I size baby. I size baby. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, if you ask my daughter, I she would know because she's. Right now. Oh. You got to do it. All right, stop. <laughs> I, I actually learned that in middle school to impress a boy, and it worked. Oh, oh nice. Very good. Hannah's telling all of her secrets now, too. Okay, so now I have a question for you, Hannah. Okay, there was a popular sitcom in the 90s that was set in New York City. What was it? I'm going to say Friends. Ooh, yes, that yeah. is correct. Okay, so now you guys are one in one. Well, one in one. Seinfeld was set in the the New York City. Sorry, was it in sorry. the 90s too? Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. So you guys at home, I don't know if you guys are playing along with us, but are, were you guys correct in your answers at home? Um, so now we have one more question we're going to ask. I want you guys, we're not going to tell you if you're correct because this is a tiebreaker, okay? Uh -huh. Okay, but we're going to have you both answer. Okay, there is a popular animal, stuffed animals that came out, a collection in the Ooh, 90s. I know the tell one. me what it was. Beanie Babies. She's right. Beanie Babies. Yeah. Oh, they're both right. Okay, so you guys are both tied. By the way, I, I would Very. highly recommend investing if you want to lose your money. <laughs> if you <laughs> want to lose. I don't know. Those Beanie Babies. You know, I read a news story one time where there was a couple that went through a very, um, you know, bitter a custody battle over yeah. a Beanie Baby collection. So <laughs> I, heard, I, I heard about that one too. <laughs> it's crazy. And it was very serious. So folks, uh, if you want to have some fun, join us for Trivia Night. Yes. This is like all about it. April 28th, it's going to be a great way to raise funds. Join us for Trivia Night. May God richly bless you as we worship together today. Yes. Hello, Redemption Church. My name is Melissa Etherton, the Redemption Online host, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to Redemption Church today. If you are a first time guest, or if you have been a part of Redemption Community for quite some time, we are so happy to have you here today. Right now, I would encourage you to take out your phone, aim the camera at the QR code that you see on the screen, you will be able to connect with us here at Redemption Church as a first time guest and tell us what you think of the service today. Also, you will be able to sign up for Next Steps, which is a three week experience that will help you make friends, have fun, and find your way in the community here at Redemption Church. Also, you will be able to follow along with Pastor Robbie's sermon, which will start in just a few moments. So let's get out our outline and open God's word together today. Hey, good morning, Redemption Church. Glad everybody's here. Everybody ready to worship this morning? All right, let's stand together and do just that.
Hey, you guys can be seated for just a moment. We are so thankful that you're here this morning. My name is Robbie, and uh, I get to be the lead pastor this week. No, just kidding. Um, I am the lead pastor of this church, and uh, we are so thankful that you are here with us today. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks that are here every single week. Sometimes uh, we get some new folks, and um, I heard today we had some folks coming to watch the eclipse uh, tomorrow and uh, had questions about the parking lot. Of course, it's out there. Use it. Have fun. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you're here today and you're new, I would love for you to say hi. Now, we make that easy at Redemption Church. You just grab a, a phone, you aim it at that QR code. It's going to take you to a little web page where there's a sermon outline we've provided for you, a place where you can click and say hi. And, uh, you know, our, our hope this morning is that you would just meet with the Lord, right? I don't want to be heard. I want you to hear from Him. Let's take a minute. Let's pray. And then we'll get right back into some worship. Father, we love you. We thank you for everyone you've brought this way. Thank you for every person that has came through our door. Lord, we do pray that they connect with you and they get to connect with us as a church. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church.
There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, man on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle. Sweetness at the mercy seat. Now I've tasted it's not hard to see. Only you can satisfy this honey in the rock. This honey in the rock. This honey in the rock. Come on, church. This honey in the rock. Todd Hunter. I serve as a lay elder here, so uh, let's open the service with a prayer together. Father, speak truth into our hearts, guiding us with wisdom. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, gals, grab your Bibles. We are going to begin a brand new teaching series this morning. If you are a uh, 
turning the page, we're going to be over in Isaiah in the 44th chapter. If you're a little more technical and you're like, man, I didn't bring my Bible, but I got my phone, grab that phone, aim it at that QR code, scroll down to the bottom where it says sermon outline. Um, or if you just want a redemption hack, open a redemption app, click the sermon, turn the volume down so it doesn't start sharing me, and then hit sermon outline. Either way, you get there a bunch of ways. But, um, you know, we start a new series, started a new series Wednesday night. For those that may or may not know, this is the third service of the week for us. They're all identical. And, and um, you know, this series called Boot Camp, uh, we thought about this series a little while back because here's the reality. The reality is, is that God has done a lot in the last couple weeks. He has done a lot. I don't know if you guys have seen or heard the numbers. Put some of them out there on social. But, um, you know, Friend Day, we had 856 people, I believe, that were here. And 38 people accepted Christ, which is pretty wild, you know. And then on Easter, we had 1,149 people here that week, right? 63 people have accepted Christ over the last two weeks. Isn't that pretty amazing? I saw you in the baptistry baptizing folks over that, right? We, uh, this morning at 9.15, we had another person get baptized, and, and you're like, so we started this boot camp series, right? And boot camp series is because our mission as a church isn't left to us. You know, I, I talked to some pastors, they're like, well, we're all about feeding the poor, we're all about this, we're all about that, we're all, and it's almost like they have this Rolodex, and they're like spinning it and saying, well, this is what we're about. But we don't get that privilege, right? The Bible is pretty clear that Jesus, this church doesn't belong to Robbie or Todd or any of the other lay elders. It doesn't belong to you. This church belongs to God. And if we want to see God continue to move and give life and do amazing things in our lives, um, then we have to surrender and we have to yield to his authority in our life. And so understanding that there are 63 new believers, and I know that there are more than that, but uh, we understand this, that what Jesus left us to do is found in the Great Commission. That's in Matthew, right, at the end of the chapter. Before he ascends up into heaven, this is literally what he tells the church to be about. He said, I want you to uh, make uh, disciples. I want you to teach them all the things that I've taught you. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So if you're here with us today and you are one of those 63 people who slipped your hand up in the last two weeks and said, you know what? I have repented of my sins and I put my faith and trust in Jesus, whether it was the first time or the 41st time, right? But I am coming back to him. Then um, the command that he leaves for you is to be baptized. And baptism is a beautiful demonstration of your life, right, being um, saved, being changed. Jesus was, he hung on a cross. They placed him in a tomb. You walk off in that water, you're saying that the old Robbie Smith or the old whatever, whatever your name is, that old person that didn't live for God, that only lived for self, is dead and gone. And as you come out of that water, you are declaring that the new risen Savior is living inside of you. And so there is a link for you to sign up to be baptized. We do spontaneous baptisms as well. If you, at the end of this sermon, you're like, man, I've got to do that today. I've got clothes. I've got a towel all back there. You just need to let us know that. Otherwise, if you're like, man, I'd like to do that and have grandma or grandpa, husband, brother, sister, whatever, uh, even your you know, blind seeing eye dog, if he needs to come in and watch you get baptized, you can click that link and you can sign up. We'll get you taken care of. We'll get you on the schedule um, other than that, Jesus said, I want you to disciple people. And so I want you to teach those things that I taught you. And so one of the, the truths that we're going to dive into today is this truth found in Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 7. And I've mentioned we have a lot of new folks with us. And so church, a little reminder, um, we believe God's word is his word, correct? How do we read bold text in these sermon outlines? We read it boldly, so don't let me down. Don't be a wimp. Don't be a sissy, right? Read this thing boldly. Here we go. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the? Oh, that's a sissy. I am the? Oh, you got to wake up. I am the? And the? Besides me, there is no God. And then the question is asked, who is like me? Who is like God? I'm going to tell you. The answer to that is no one. There is none like God who is everywhere all of the time, who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, who loves you more than you love yourself, more than your mom and daddy or your grandma and grandpa, right? There, there is no one who's done more for you. There's no, more who, no one who will do more for you. There's no one in all of existence of all of creation that is like him. 
And you know, this shouldn't be an issue in Christianity, but it is. What happens when you start serving or worshiping other things than God? That's called idol worship. Anything that you love, anything that you pursue, anything that takes your focus off of God and onto temporal pleasures or other things, that's called idol worship. And I got news for you. We all do that. I've been in the church. I've been saved for 26 years. I'm 52. Been saved 26 years. And, and I still realize that there are times when an idol will creep up in my life. And I'll identify that idol, hopefully get rid of it, right? Because idols cost you a lot. We need to destroy the idols in our life before they destroy us. And don't make a mistake. They're not something to be played with, right? You know me. I love guns. I love shooting guns. I love... And it, you're like, is your gun loaded? Absolutely. And that's what an idol is. It can do damage, right? You got to be aware. You got to be mindful. So this shouldn't be difficult, but if you look over uh, the history of mankind, the Canaanites, you're going to find some Old Testament folks and some New Testament folks in this il illustration. But the reality is the Canaanites who owned the land before God's people went in to conquer the land, they had their idols, right? The, the Egyptians who enslaved God's people for, for 480 years, they had their idols. The Babylonians, when God, God's people had turned to worshiping idols themselves and turned away from the one true God, when they had forgotten that he is the first and the last and there is none like him, right? When they had turned away from that, God says, okay, I'm going to discipline you with the Babylonians. Well, guess what? The Babylonians had their own idols. And then in the New Testament, when the Greeks and the Romans came rolling into Jerusalem and took power, guess what they brought with them? You got it. They're false gods and their idols. All different kinds of people from all over have worshiped idols. That has been a real issue. Yet the Bible makes it clear that there is one God. He is the first and the last, and there are none like him. He is the first and the last, and there are none like him. You've got to go home with that. You've got to think about that. Because when you, you're like, why is this so important? Because look at what happens in Romans 1. Let's dive back into the Bible. Romans 1, verse 19 through 25. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to him. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal pleasure, power, and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Now, now let me tell you what he's saying here. Paul is taking a very simple truth, saying you should be able to look at creation and realize that everything that is created has an order. It's not chaos. And it has an order because there is a creator. So... In the parking lot, there are a lot of, man, I, I, I know this is going to get me grief. but So, like, if you went down the rows of vehicles, you could see, like, there's a Ford there. Yeah. There's a Dodge there. <coughs> I'm about to puke on that one. Then there's the Chevy, right? Then there's the Chevy out there. But none of those vehicles did you look at and say, oh, they just appeared. You would look at each one of them and say, there's a creator, right? And whoever created the Chevy, you're like, oh, right? <laughs> Sorry, Todd. But, but here, here's the reality is that you, you look at creation. So I'll give you an example. When I saw the ocean for the first time um, that I can remember, I think I saw it as a kid. I have no memory of that. But, but as an adult, I was a believer. And you know, when I saw the ocean, you know what I thought? I say I'd read the passages where it said, oh, the depths and the breath of God's love for you. And I compared that instantly. I saw the ocean and went, man, look how big this, this is an amazing body of water, right? And God loves me more than that. That's what creation is supposed to do. It's supposed to point you to the creator. So he says, Paul says, the apostle Paul says, he says, for God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that he made. And then he looks at us, mankind, and he says, so they're without excuse. For although they knew God, help me out, church, they did not honor him, what? They didn't honor him as God, or they didn't give him thanks. But they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and what'd they do? They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal what? And, 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 that's right. They, res they, they started making images of mortal man, bird, animals, and creepy things. They started making idols. Look at God's response to this. 
God, therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the what? Creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, that's the indictment against all mankind. Doesn't matter your color. Doesn't matter what language you speak. That is the indictment against all mankind that we take what we know to be true about God and we exchange that for a lie. Now, when you, when you hear of that happening, there is an Old Testament illustration I think is a beautiful one, and it really shows the irony of mankind and our ignorance. Look at a, a few verses down from Isaiah where he said, I am the first, I am the last, there is, uh, besides me there is no God, and there's none like me. A couple verses down it says this, it gives you an illustration of this. He says, there's a carpenter, and the carpenter stretches out a line. He marks it with a pencil, he shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He goes on to say he cuts down cedars or maybe he chooses a cypress tree or an oak tree and he lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for the man. This is an example. He takes part of the tree and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a what? That's a problem, isn't it? Also, from a tree, he makes a god. And what does he do to it? He worships it. And he makes it a what? He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Now, get this. Half of it burns in the fire. Over the, the half, he eats his meat. He roasts it and says, ah, oh, I'm satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, ah, oh, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, falls down to it and worships to it. Guess what he does? He what? Pray. He prays to it and says, deliver me, from, uh, deliver me for you are. Now I'm going to tell you, isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever heard? That you would take God, you would look at a sun, you would look at an ocean, you would look at trees, you would look at the mountains, you would look at a person, you would look at a little individual baby, right, who grows into a human being, to like a full-grown adult. You would look at all of this and you would say, oh, there is no God, I need to make a God. I mean, don't you know the Bible says in Genesis 1, God created man from the dust of the ground up. He breathed in him and man became a living soul. The Bible says that God in six days created everything here, the moon, the stars, the planets. We take all of that knowledge and we say, no, thank you. Let me walk out to the woods, chop a tree down. Let me, let me build a fire. Let me roast some of the food I've harvested, right? Let me cook some meat. Say, oh, I'm satisfied and I'm warm. And then... And then let me just bow down to it and pray to this thing I've made in my own hands. I've heard stupid in my life, but that takes the cake. You know what I'm talking about? That takes the absolute cake. You get the prize for idiot if that's you, right? Because, because you're chopping a wood. Down. How are you praying to something you made? How are you worshiping something you made? That, that makes no sense. Makes no sense. Doctor comes in the room and tells me I have cancer and I'm going to bow down and I'm going to pray to something I fashioned out with my own hands. When Angie and I were um, in Venezuela, we would walk through the mountains and, and on a mission trip in Venezuela. And we walked through the mountains and you would see this thing that looked like a doghouse. And the doghouse would be on the side of a mountain. And it had um, iron bars in front of it and it had candles on the inside. And they had little papers and candles burning inside of them. And I'm like, I got to know, what is that? Like a doghouse with a, a, a padlock and an iron gate? And he said, oh, that's, that's Catholicism. That's, that's where they go and worship. I said, on the side of a mountain? I said, what's up with the candle? He said, well, as long as the candle's burning, a saint is praying for you. What's up with the jar? Why are the candles in the jar? Because the wind blows. I said, oh, so you mean like, that's so powerful, and all of a sudden you don't have anything praying for you? Well, that's what they believe. No thanks, I'll take a risen Savior. I'll kick the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'll take the creator of the heavens and the universe over that. 
I, I, I look at this illustration and I say, well, what, when you think of a man chopping down a tree, boom, it falls, cutting off a limb, making a fire, roasting your food over it, getting warm from it, making an image, and then bowing down to it and saying, you're my God, now save me, now deliver me. Do you not think of National Geographic and an old, um, you, you think of somebody in a third world country? Don't you think of that? That's what I think of. Because surely we're smarter than this. Surely as, as civilization has come, we're, we have gotten beyond this, Right? This is for the uneducated. This is for the uncivilized, you would think. Well, guess what? Idolatry is still in existence today. In Jesus' day, there was this young man called the rich young ruler. He walks up to Jesus and he asks the right question. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I get to know I have you in my life? I'm forgiven. How do I get to know that I've been adopted in your family? How do I get to know that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with you? And Jesus looks at him, and Jesus, because Jesus is the first and the last, and there's no other like him, he looks right into the heart of the man, and he goes, oh, I see your idol. So Jesus calls out his idol. And you know what he says to the man? He says, go sell all that you have, and then follow me. Does the guy go sell all that he has and follows him? Does the guy say, put the house up for sale, put the boat up for sale, get rid of the four-wheeler and the side-by-side, let's, let's get all of this, we're going to follow Jesus? Does he do that? No, no, he doesn't. He walks away from Jesus, and the Bible says he's very sorrowful because he has lots of possessions. But that's not just a story in the Bible in the New Testament 2,000 years old. There are people today who allow material possessions to get in the way of their relationship with God. There are people who won't commit and follow Jesus fully because It'll cost them money. It'll cost them time. They don't have time for God. They're trying to build their fortune. Material possessions. You know, he believed that if I can get this, if I can get that, I'll be happy. If I can just have this boat, this bow, this car, this deer stand, if I could just have this side by side, if I could just have this label on the back of my jeans, if I could just live here, if I could drive this, if I could do that, then I would have peace and I would have happiness and I'd have joy. And none of that brings it because guess what? That idol is no different than the idol that was cut down out of the forest and those things are not able, a car, a, a truck, a boat, a bow and arrow, a side-by-side, a whatever your thing is that you got to have, an iPhone, a technology, a label on a gene, those things cannot save you or enhance your life in any way, shape, or form. They're powerless, just as powerless as that tree, that branch that was cut down made into that idol. And then you look at the religious crowd. Jesus He had multiple confrontations with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, if you're new to the Bible, the Pharisees were the religious teachers and the leaders of the day. When God had stopped finishing sending prophets and prophets, there was an era called the silent era. It's in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's the silent era. During the silent era, God wasn't speaking through prophets. God was silent, called the silent era. Ah, Get it, right? He wasn't speaking to his people. So people rose up, religious leaders, And they started speaking on behalf of God. And they started making, taking what God had said and they started adding to it. And they started making it much more difficult, much more um, a struggle to follow God. And, And Jesus had a conversation with them one day. He said, you know, you guys are so focused on outward appearance. Now I'm going to tell you, there are some people that would say, Robbie, why are you preaching on a Sunday morning in camouflage? Short answer, we're doing a series called Boot Camp. Thought it was fitting. Second answer, I happen to like this shirt. I love you, but if you don't like it, kick rocks. We're okay. You know what I'm saying? It's not about my faith and my spirituality. is isn't about what I wear to church. Amen? That's not what it's about. It's not about a suit and a tie. It's not about a certain appearance, right? Hey, you better concern, be concerned with what the thing's going on the inside of Robbie. If you're, actually, you need to be concerned about what's going on inside of you. But, but the reality is this. Like, I could put on a good show, but it matters what's on the inside. Jesus said this to the religious Pharisees when he said, you guys remind me of a graveyard. You look at the headstones. Nice, fancy engravings on that granite. You forget that just feet below it, nothing but death, dead men's bones. And that's what you've turned a relationship and a walk with God. And you have replaced a need for God's grace. You've replaced it with doing. You are now serving the idol of self-righteousness. 
And that idol still lives today. That idol still is very powerful today. It's distorting a lot of things today. I live a better life than you. I'm a better person than you. I'm a better husband than you. I'm a better spouse to you. My kids are better than you are. Surely God is going to accept us and we're going to make it to heaven and we'll be fine in eternity because after all, if he's got to choose between you and me, surely he's going to choose me. That's self-righteousness. That's an idol that is worshipped all over. You think by doing something or a, a repeating a pattern of doing that God's going to accept you into eternity? You're no different than the Pharisees. You're still worshipping the, the idol of self-righteousness. I, I think about King Herod. Here's a good one. King Herod, his idol was power and pleasure. King Herod, if you know anything about him, go back and read Matthew in the second chapter. Someone tells him there's a prophecy about a Israel, about a, a new Messiah, a deliverer, a new king of Israel, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, this is a hard story. This is a hard illustration, but he says this, this child has already been born. This is what they tell him. And you know what this guy does? Because he's about power and pleasure. He says, well, tell me what time was this kid born? Was this new king born? And, and they give him a, a time span. He said, okay. He all marched down. He takes his soldiers and he marches down. Well, he doesn't go, but he sends his soldiers down to Bethlehem. He says, kill every male child two years and under. Two years and under. They took children from their mothers and they took them to the rivers and they cast them in the rivers. They took children from their mothers and they took stones and they crushed their skulls. They took children and they cut them in half because he was serving the idol of power. No one can challenge me. I got to have power. I got to have, uh, I got to be able to say to this, go do this and they do it. No one can challenge me and if I'm going to have a king who's going to rise up, I'm going to take him out when he's young. The idol of power. Look at our politics today and tell me that there's not an idol of power still existing today. Or the idol of pleasure. Heard of Jeff Epstein's Island? You heard about that? Well, guess what? King Herod was no different than Epstein's Island. King Herod would bring little boys in, in the cover of darkness, molest them, and then walk them out on the back of the balcony and cast them over the cliff, discarding his evidence. One day, King Herod, the Bible tells this story of King Herod sitting down and eating and a girl is dancing in front of him and he lusts after her so much, he actually says, G you name it, you name it and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you anything you want, I just want her. And they say, give us John the Baptist's head on a platter because John was calling out King Herod's sexual immorality. He had John the Baptist beheaded and he put his head on a platter for her. Power and pleasure. Power and pleasure and pleasure. These idols are still alive today. And do you see how they shape you? Do you see how they take you to places you never thought you would go? You, you clicked a website. You watched a video. And four years later, it ruined your marriage. Four years later, you can't, you look at a woman and you only see two parts of her. You, you're focused on two things. Power and pleasure. Still alive today. There was a time when uh, Jesus was, uh, two people, two brothers came to him and said, um, hey, Jesus, um, I know you're a great teacher and all, but our folks died and we got some stuff. Like there's a farm and a house and a state and all this. And it's unclear. Would you tell my brother I'm supposed to get this stuff? Now that never happens today, does it? People arguing over the estates of their parents when they're left. They never do that. They do that even when there is a will and testament. <laughs> Anyway, Jesus looks at him and says, who made me judge or arbitrator over you all? And then he tells this parable of the fool. And this, he, he says this, he said, one day, this farmer, he, all of a sudden he got this bumper crop, which literally means if he had, normally he'd get maybe 100 bushels an acre, he got 1,000 bushels an acre that year. And he said, what am I going to do with all this wealth? I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. I'll put my stuff in those bigger barns. And then guess what? I'll kick back and I'll have an easy life. 
Sounds just like that brother who's coming to Jesus and said, my folks just died. I got all this wealth if I can just secure it for myself. <laughs> Jesus said, this, this parable, or this, this parable, this fool, let me tell you about him. He said, you can kick your feet up, but your soul will be required of you this very night. And that man died. He ignored, I, th I think about this man and how the mistakes he makes. He ignored the needs of others. Absolutely ignored the needs of others. Look at all this extra income. Look at all this extra crop, all this extra money. I'm going to put it in a bank account. I'm going to invest it. It's going to, I'm going to be able to kick my feet up on the beach. I'm going to be able to go to this resort, that resort. I'm going to take life easy. He never thought of others, ever. And I'll tell you what else he did. He lacked gratitude. Thank you, God, for this. Now, how, who can I help with this? You, you might have, if you've been here in the last couple of weeks, I can't remember. I share so many stories of my life, I can't remember. I, I've shared this story, I just don't remember when. But if you're new, maybe it'll be new for you. I sat down about a month, month and a half ago with a bunch of pastors, something I rarely do. But I sat down with a bunch of pastors outside of our church and went to one of their meetings and was listening to them talk. And we were sitting down at Bob Evans. And I noticed that as the time, you know, we'd been there two and a half hours, and one of the things that I noticed quickly is that almost all of them just had coffee. Now, I'm not a coffee drinker. What does a coffee cost at Bob Evans? Anybody? Three fifty? Two fifty. Two fifty, okay. So what is your tip going to be on two fifty? A couple bucks? Well, you're not going to tip? You are a typical church crowd. <laughs> Come on now, somebody's not going to let me down. So, so, so maybe a couple bucks, maybe you throw a couple. So I started doing the math, and I'm like, this lady worked for us for two and a half hours. I'm telling you, she was working. She was topping those cups of coffee off, you know. She was working. And I, me and one other guy was the only guy that had a meal that day. And I'm thinking, this lady's only going to, she's going to work for two and a half hours, and she's going to make a couple bucks off of us. So I took all the tickets from all the other guys. I said, I got your coffee this morning. Don't worry. I walked to the register. I asked the person at the register, now, how much would she get in two hours worth of working? They didn't want to tell me. I said, would $60 tip be enough? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, hey, Shirley, you need to thank this man. He's just going to tip you 60 bucks, which is not what I expected. Shirley walked over and gave me kind of a hug, a side hug. And a tear was coming in her eyes. She was getting teary-eyed. And see, here's the reality. 60 bucks wouldn't make a difference in my life. Just wouldn't. But in her life, it made a difference. Extra's not for you. That's what this, this rich fool didn't understand. Extra was for others. God had blessed him. And one of the ways he says thanks is he makes a difference and helps other people out. He lacked gratitude. He was greedy and he was selfish. He had been distracted by his wealth. Had he understood that his wealth was actually given to him so that he could bless other people, that would have made a difference. But no, he's a rich fool. He wants to just take care of number one. And, and then you could go to the New Testament church in the book of Corinth, right? The Corinthians, their idol was popularity and fame. Now, now I should probably jump ahead and just say, how many of you know how many times Taylor Swift made an appearance at the Super Bowl? Any, any number of appearances you know? I'm going to ask you, what does it matter? We were watching football. You know what I'm saying? What does that got to do with anything? That has absolutely nothing. Oh, but that's power. That's, that's popularity and that's fame. I bet you that there are so many of you that know every lyric to her song and know a lot about her. You probably know more her, about her than you do Jesus. Or you know more about a quarterback than you know Jesus. Or you know more about a UFC fighter than you know about Jesus. Popularity and fame, and that's idols still alive today. In Corinth, this is what they did. They, they, they idolized their preacher. I follow Paul. Oh, no, I, I like when Apollos preaches. I follow him. Oh, oh, no, I like when Cephas or Peter. I like when Peter preaches. I'll follow him. They were so messed up between this Jew and Gentile thing, they were worried about their reputation. So if you don't know, a Gentile is someone in the Bible that isn't Jewish. Anybody in the world that's not Jewish, you're called a Gentile. We're a room full of Gentiles if, if you're not Jewish, right? And so, so what would happen is they'd gather for these, these uh, what were they called, um, these meals. Well, I guess they had potlucks back then. They'd gather for these potlucks. They wouldn't wait on the Gentiles or even the poor people. You know what they'd do? They'd just go ahead and eat. The Gentiles would show up. There'd be different behavior. They would, the leaders would treat people differently. Worried about their reputation. 
You think that idol doesn't live today? Embarrassed because of something your husband did, your wife did, your kid did, your grandkid did, and making that an issue? Instead of just worrying about them, worrying about what other people think of you? That idol will wear you out. That idol will wear you out. This is so bad in Corinth that God gave spiritual gifts. Gifts of tongues, gifts of hospitality, multiple different gifts. And the Bible teaches that God gives gifts, preaching, evangelism, hospitality, the gift of serving, the gift of administration. He gives all of these different gifts. And he gives them so that you can serve others with those gifts. But let me tell you how perverted Corinth was. Hey, look at me, I can speak in tongues. Hey, look at me, I got the gift of preaching. Hey, look at me, I got this gift, I got that gift, I got this gift, and I got that gift. They were so messed up, they struggled with idols. But now let's talk about us for a second. Angie might want to buckle your seatbelt at this moment. Because wouldn't it be wrong to only talk about everybody else's issues other than talking about ours? Can we talk about our idols for a moment? I mean, we can talk about the guy in the mud hut. We can talk about the guy chopping down the tree. Or we can talk about the Corinthian problem or the rich parable of the rich young fool. We can talk about all these idols. But let me tell you where it gets really interesting when I start stepping on your toes, when you start stepping on my toes, right? When we start dealing with our own idols, that's really what we're about today. How do we get closer to God? How do we repent? How do we realize that there is a first and a last and there is no other God but one God and we need to worship him with all of our heart, soul, and strength and we need to cast down our own idols. How do we, how do we, we have to talk about our idols. Some of you have allowed sexuality to be an idol. Now, how do you know sexuality is an idol? Because you're busy shacking up instead of getting married. Busy having sex all the time instead of getting married and following God's design. Got quiet. Not one amen there. So that's what happens when you attack an idol. That's what happens when you attack an idol. People get offended. Nationalism. Hey, I I love our country. I support our troops. We're getting ready to hit into Memorial Day, and on our podcast, we're going to have, I'm trying to get a guy who is in Somalia on the crash site in the movie you might know of, Black Hawk Down. He used to go to church here. He was on the crash site, and I want to hear his story. I want to hear that story of what was it like when you pulled up to Somalia and bullets are flying everywhere. I've heard bits of it, but I want to hear the full story. So I, I'm a full supporter of law enforcement. I'm a full supporter of our military. Uh, you know, I'm patriotic as they come. But Jesus' flag and banner is higher than the American flag. And our country really does need to repent and turn back to God. We'd stop murdering babies left and right. We'd stop with the pronouns. We'd stop with a bunch of nonsense that doesn't exist, shouldn't exist. These are all idols and distractions about what really matters, and God is the one that really matters. Technology is an idol today. You tell me your iPhone or your Android phone doesn't get in your way of your walk with God when you're on it all the time, when you pick it up more than you pick up the Bible? Oh, pastor, my my Bible's on my phone. Good for you. Get on the Bible app. Get in the Bible. Get off the social media. You know what I'm saying? Technology is one of those real things. Some of you have made your job your worship. I got to get this job. I got to get this money. I got to get this thing, and I got to make that. That's an idol. You know, Paul walked into a town called Athens, and he walked around, and one of the things that he said about it when he walked around it, he's like, you guys have idols set up everywhere that you're praying to. You even have an idol to an unknown. The, the name on the idol is called the unknown God. You're trying to cover all the bases just in case I'm missing a God. I want to pray to him as well. I'll tell you what idols do. Idols are a distraction from God. They promise more than they deliver, and they cost you more than you ever want to pay. They get in in the way of your relationship with God. That's what idols do. You want to know more about idols, you need to look at that sermon outline right now. You want to know the damage and the destruction? Look at your sermon outline. There's a blue link that says something about destroying idols. You need to click that and sign up so I can send you one text message a day for the next five days with a story of how an idol has brought someone down. Spoiler alert, day five is how Jesus didn't let idols get in his way. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Acts 17. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord over heaven and earth, he doesn't live in temples made by man. 
nor is he served with human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. He determined allotted periods, that means your birthday, and the boundaries, that means you're in Southern Illinois today because he, if that's where you live, then he chose that for you. Verse 27, he did this that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from See, you live in a world that is so full of idols. You can't name them, count them all. And every idol is competing for your heart. Every idol wants to take you and distract you away from what's really true, what's really matter, and that's your relationship with God. All the while, Jesus Christ hung on a cross displaying to the world how great his love is for you. He was placed in a tomb and he rose from the dead and you choose to serve and worship things that can't help you. They can't help you. Only God can help you. And he wants to. And this is what he says. Verse, verse 29 says, being then God offspring, we ought not to think of the divine being as like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of man. He says, stop chopping that tree down. Stop worshiping all the man-made idols. And this is why, verse 30, this is why this matters to you. But the times of ignorance God overlooked. But, but, but this day, but today, it, it's now means the same today as it meant when it was written 2,000 years ago. But now he commands all people everywhere to do what? Amen. To repent. Repent isn't feel sorry, feel remorseful, feel bad. That's not repentance. Repentance is I'm worshiping idols. I'm pursuing fame. I'm pursuing fortune. I'm pursuing sexuality. I'm pursuing my own identity and my own self. I'm pursuing all the things that I want to. I'm chopping down a tree. I'm fashioning an idol. And then God speaks to me and I turn from that and I leave that behind. And I'm going to get married and I'm going to show him or her how much I truly do love him or her by honoring God and making a commitment. I'm going to repent from materialism and I'm going to turn to God and I'm going to say, you know what? My money and my wealth isn't just for me. I'm going to bless that waitress or that waiter. I'm going to help that neighbor. I'm going to help that guy. I'm telling you, I'm on the fence right now. I got this... Kyle, you'll laugh at this because you gave me this guy, but my lawn mowing business, I got this guy that he's like, he's a tight, this old man's tight. Man, if he can save $5, he's won the Super Bowl. You know what I'm talking about? But I can tell you what's happening in my heart. This is what he told me this year. I'm going to take care of the yard myself. Number one, I want to say, oh man, you're way too old to be taking care of this yard. And this yard is a terrible yard. Oh my gosh, it's horrible. But it's at the end of my drive, like at the end of my neighborhood. And my wife said the other day, I thought he just, I thought, yeah, you go find, see if you can find somebody to do your yard a little cheaper. More power to you. And then Angie said to me, he probably can't afford to get his yard cut, his grass cut. You do remember he's got that three-year-old that he's raising at, in his 80s. He's raising a three-year-old because his daughter's on meth. <sighs> yard. Now I got to mow his yard for free. You know what I'm saying? What's the idol that you need to cast aside? What's the idol that you need to get away from? What's the thing that distracts you? Really quickly. Idols distract you and they cost you a relationship with God. And today you need to ask God to identify your idol. You need to acknowledge that idol to God. In a practical way, you need to turn from that idol and turn to the living God. You need to take the time and, and money and resources that you devoted to that idol and you need to give that to God. <coughs> then you need to tell somebody else so you can build accountability because we will want to come back to that idol. You need to live for God today. You walked in here with idols today. I know you did. All of us do. 
Today we need to cast down those idols. Why? Because God is the first and He is the last. And besides Him, there is no other. Who is like the Lord, church? Who has done more for you than Jesus Christ? Father, we come to you today asking you to challenge our hearts today. Wherever our lives and our hearts, God, none are better than the other in this room, myself included. God, there are things that are idols who are competing for our hearts. Today, God, I ask that you help us to cast down those idols and return our hearts back to the one true God, you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
touch this morning from the Lord? How many of you have went through something this week and all you wanted to do was just get here and worship this morning? And just give it up. Give it all to you this morning. Let's sing it one more time.
guys can be seated for just a moment. Reuben is going to be baptized today. And there is a uh, huge story you'll have to get at a later time about Reuben. Go ahead, Jenny. Okay, so this is Reuben here. Um, Reuben is my best friend's foster child. And this kid has really been through a lot. And just him coming into our lives has been the greatest thing. And uh, hopefully, here so soon, he gets to be adopted. And they get to find that out here. I mean, any day, they'll find out when Reuben gets to be adopted. And what better way, you know, he's being adopted into, into the Lord's family here because he's decided that Jesus died for him and his sins, and he's going to live that life. And uh, so, so with that, Reuben, I'm going to have you in okay, the of my hands. All right, I'm going to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Go worship and serve God and God alone. We love y'all. Have a great week.